And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me as always, I have my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadari Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. We are, eh, we are at the final class entry for our journey through Heavens and Heresies. Which also means it's going to be the final one where, it, where we're able to do this relatively quickly. Look forward to gigantic info dumps in the future. Yep, we knew we knew that was cut. Do, doing classes individually is relatively is relatively easy for this format. Um, but what? But but starting next week, it's going to be it's going to be back to the hard stuff. No, 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 this is not a drug reference, so so whoever's thinking that, stop. It's not a drug reference, but it might be one for alcohol. This is the monastery, after all. Yeah, which, incident, incidentally, um, t um, t the guy doing Tales of Bren made, 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 gave, made me my own, made me my own drink, and then on Twitter had asked what, had asked what kind of, what kind of drink, what kind of drink would it be? Um... <laughs> Although, given the given the fact that I, that that what that I am on the I am on the top shelf of the bar, um, Mildred Monk, as as it, as it's shown in the Bren bar, probably doesn't come cheap. Which means that it is likely a high class honey liquor of some sort, based off of Old Norse. Fermentation and distillation. I had I had actually. I can't rec I can't. Rec I'll have to I'll have to di I'll have to um dig what I had said, but I think. I, let me let me see if I can let me see if I can find it. For all of those for for those of you who might be curious about a liquor named after me or made after me. Um, it's fairly simple. An extremely high shelf scotch. Fuck you, that's why. I had said it was a dry stout beer. Oh. A dry stout beer that's top shelf? <laughs> what? I was think. <sighs> I like Guinness. I'm not someone who likes beer, but I hear Guinness is pretty good, so, you know, you've got taste at it's least. Good. It's good, but it's a meal. <laughs> <laughs> But I I I went with I went with something like that because I because I figured you need you need if for <laughs> for a man of our size we need something that's a lot more filling. So it's a good yes. <laughs> and well, get well a a thing a thing <laughs> again. This is gonna do is gonna do that. So I went with something like that, just with just with inherited te inherited old techniques. Indeed. All right, makes sense. Oh. Maybe Mildred Monk is, is 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 a is a liquor from another part of your brewery and distillery. <laughs> yeah. It's not the stash. I think this I think the stash would be the honeyed one you you mentioned. I got to I got to keep your Norse gimmick going. Mm -hmm. But with that said, we are as I mentioned before, we are tackling the last of the classes in Heavens and Heresies this week. And also, and also subsequently, the last casting class that we that we've te that we have, especially since one of them was a case of two stones with one bird. We are tackling the wizard. Too many Z's, monk. It's just the wizard. <laughs> he he uh he also said that he would try not to make any uh particular Discworld jokes or Rincewind jokes, but uh he already failed at go. I said I would try. I didn't say I would succeed. Yeah, but you failed at go, monk. That's not even trying. It te it technically is. I l I didn't fail at the word go because we're because we're about four minutes in. So <laughs> so I am technically correct. The best kind of correct. Yeah. Now the wiz the wizard, of course, is one of the big four, and. 
when we did, a while back when we did the ranking fourth edition classes um, special, something something dawned on me when I ended up when I ended up putting the wizard at a lower tier than some of the other arcane classes. The wizard and the fighter, aside from the aside aside from the addition everybody hates but us, have kind of a similar have had kind of a similar problem over the years. The biggest, pr the biggest problem that the wizard has is the fact that other casting classes exist. Much like the same re the reason the biggest problem that the fighter has is that other martial classes exist. Because the gimmick with them is that they can do their one particular... They have, a lar they have the largest variety of their one particular thing. The fighter can equip any kind of weapon. The wizard has a whole lot, has a much wider variety of spell uses than other cl than other classes but beyond th but beyond that what do they have and more and in particular what do they have to compete with the uh, with the other martial classes that are coming that came about like if somebody want if somebody wants to do a whole lot of fighty stuff what what's stopping them from picking paladin, which does that and other things, um, or what stop that what's stopping that from what's stopping them from picking barbarian in that regard? Um, and the case of I'd say the wizard, it's e it's even worse because why pick why pick a wizard for all the casty when you can do casty and other things by picking a druid or later on a sorcerer or a warlock or a cleric. Okay, the cleric is, the cleric part is a bit of a stretch since that's also one of the big four, but I think you see where I'm getting at with this. To boil it down for those who aren't quite getting it, fighter and wizard do basic thing. Basic fighty fight, basic casty cast. They do more of basic thing than any other class. But other classes do basic thing, fighty, fighty, casty, casty, and then other stuff on top of it, mm -hmm. making it more interesting and versatile. Yeah. If I to use a to use a video game comparison, games like um a lot of sh a lot of shooters will boast about the huge variety of firearms that they ha that they have, but how much does that huge variety of firearms actually matter? When in practicality you're going to be using a handful and sticking and sticking to that particular style. In the same vein, for for um fighter, you can have all you can have all the you can have all the potential variety in the world, but for the most part, most char most characters who play fighter are going to pick one particular style of equipment and stick to that for their entire career. Usually something with reach. Either you know, you I use. I tend to see, I tend to see two two patterns of two patterns. Of, I tend to see a small set of patterns emerge. Either um, either sword and board. Obviously, that's one of the that's the most boring way to do it. Bigger sword, bigger sword. Or um, poke and board. I.e. Wep i.e. reach weapon and shield. Yep. And there's nothing. Individually, there's the this is I'd say that's where the whole ba the whole um, basic character argument comes. Mm -hmm. And when in a ca in the case of the wizard, they're supposed to have this huge variety of spells that they're going to go with, but in practic in practicality sense, most wizards are most wizards are probably going to be are probably going to be some level of evoker, unless the setting doesn't let them. Most wizards like to cast a tiny silver sphere that explodes in a conflagration of flames. Fireballs are the most common spell I see cast by wizards ever. To, to the point that it's a to the point that it's a bit of a meme. And one could even say a trope. And yeah, there's a bunch of other spells that w that wizards can go that wizards can go with, but the the point is when there's so many when there's so many spells in that arsenal that are situational whereas there whereas you have whereas the situation of casting fireball is going to have a wider net than casting say knock and they're going to be using the same resource 
when you're trying when you're trying to when you're trying to be as reliable of a party member as you can, which are you going to go with first? I'm going to take fireball in that spell slot because the fireball is going to do more for me. Exactly. And you look at there's been attempts to have to have it to have it where to have it where wizards double down on the um on the on the on the magic spheres system that D and D has had for the longest time. Mm -hmm. But in but in reality, that's just a bandage. I'd say. I'd say the only I'd say the only instance that came close was once again. Um, fourth edition with the with the specialization based on what sort of implement you used, whereas other editions don't really give a shit what kind of implement you use. <laughs> True. Um, all that matters is that you have one, and even the, and even then that the having of it is just a bo is just a boost a lot of times, not a outright requirement. Um. Now I asked Tanner. His thoughts on the vanilla the vanilla wizard, and as as I've done in previous ones, and I'd like to go, I'd like to go over um what he had what he had said, quote. So for me, the wizard was overtuned and overcomplicated in 5e and in 3.5e. Thank you. I actually don't mind concentration as much as y'all, but for me, okay, I'll agree to disagree there. But for me. It was the things Wizard could achieve outside of combat that could really bonk a game. Same goes for Cleric. Yep. Wizards have this agency in D&D over the game world that other classes just do not have. You want to interact with the game world? Of course you do. This is a TTRPG. Well, Wizards can do that more than any other class. I hated that. Every character should be able to interact with the game world. <coughs> Artistries. <coughs> Plus, the wizard was overly complicated for no reason. All the spell tracking and spellbook stuff was poorly implemented, not really because it was complicated, but because that complication didn't fuel any sort of class fantasy. So for me, after relegating artistries to any class that wants them, I had this whole of what should the wizard do, and designed it within the space of Heavens and Heresies, as a wits-based caster, meaning it's more about preparation, and besides, I needed a scholarly mage anyway. It's one of the things I like about my Wits Intelligence Resolve system. It allows for a good starting point for a class. But my answer to Wizard was design, to design mechanics that made it feel like it had a scholarly control over magic, with mechanics that allowed them to really prepare for encounters, assuming they'd collected enough info about whatever they're walking into, of course. They can switch their spell feats during a rest, they know a bunch of spells and can choose which to prepare each day, and can make spell scrolls to supplement their relatively low spell points. It's part of the thing that makes their casting unique. So, if the Spelunker archetype is Batman as a martial class, wizards overall are Batman casters. They get prep time. That's their superpower. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, <sighs> it, but um, before we before we dive into the crunch of the matter, I'd be remiss if if I didn't if I didn't ask you to play accent overlord for the for the opening fluff. This might be the most cursed accent I've had to come up with, monk. As in stuff before. I can... This is true, but this this one's a real challenge. What does it mean to be a wizard? When one thinks of the wizard, one will often think of the arcanist casting spells from his book, or the occultist master of rituals and their manipulation. One rarely thinks of the chronicler, dedicated to the exploration and explication of the natural world around us. And even less does one think of such as I, a hierophant. But for the sake of good debate, I would challenge you this. How am I not a wizard? Is the memorization of canticles and the study of their magical effects in practical application any less scholarly, merely because of its religious nature? If scripture has within it the fundamentals of magical theory, which as we know, it does, then why differentiate the study of it from that of a grimoire? Do they not fulfill the shame effect? Just because my body does not house the direct essence of the divine as a vessel's does, Am I any less able to teach the holy books or impart their wisdom on those that need it? 
A holy scroll is still a scroll, is it not? Cassia Psalmsayer, Scolari Sanctu, half Orkai Hierophant. Female orc. <laughs> That's probably the most cursed accent I've had to come up with. <laughs> and we have a dev note going, I know this isn't correct Latin. I know Latin, but I didn't want to write something in Latin. I wanted to write something that looks slash felt like Latin. Hey, it's, be it's better pseudo-Latin than in J.K. Rowling's work. Not that that's saying much. That was a pretty low bar. You really shouldn't compare him to it. Yeah, uh, that bar that bar is so low that a contortionist couldn't limbo under it. And obviously we couldn't limbo under it, but we but we can't. Tall guy problems. <laughs> tall, tall guy problems, monk. Mm -hmm. We can't limbo where the shit. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna say that that has to be the most the most cursed accent I've had to come up with the entire time. Mm -hmm. That's even more cursed than my uh, my completely insane dwarf that was changing accents every other word. <laughs> anyway, the core ability requirement is wits. Wits is your spellcasting ability for wizard spells, since you learn your spells through dedicated study and memorization. You use your wits whenever a spell refers to your spellcasting ability. In addition, you use your wits modifier when making an attack roll with a spell you cast or a skill attack you use. Now, with proficiencies, you gain proficiency with the... So, for defenses, you're proficient in wits defense and either resolve or intuition, depending on your core abilities. If intuition is a core ability, you're proficient in your intuition defense. If Resolve is a core ability, you are proficient in your Resolve defense. If both are, or if neither Hard. are a core ability for you, you're proficient in the defense corresponding to the higher of the two. In the case of them being even, you choose one. Basically the same as the strength deck split for the, for the martial classes. Mm -hmm. For skills, you have proficiency in Arcana. For artistries, you have proficiency in Alchemy or one of the Ritual artistries. Dev note, wizards don't get a lot of extra proficiencies because they're a wits-based casting class, meaning they're going to get a lot of proficiencies from the fact that they only need wits as a stat. Which makes sense. And you can learn one language of your choice. As a wizard, you have a number of vitality points equal to half your level rounded up. Fair, fairly standard so far. Then we get to raising the death flag. When a wizard raises the death flag, they are instantly restored to full HP, may cast spells from their spell book, which they did not prepare, make all spells attacks with advantage, their spells no longer require them to expend spell points, and they may choose three additional secondary options for spells they cast. These additional secondary options do not count against the total maximum they may channel into one spell. Man, you really wanted to go Gandalf versus the Balrog here, didn't you? <laughs> I'm not going to lie, that sounds like Gandalf versus the fucking Balrog. Oh, no. Spending every little bit of magic. Mm -hmm. I probably would I probably would have also gone with the with the old man versus X death from FF5, but um that might be that might be a bit too much of a reach for some uh, for some of our audience plus so you'd be committing the sin of bringing up video game RPGs. How's that a sin? Fuck them. This is our monastery, not theirs. Yeah. Well, fuck. your monastery, and I'm just part of it. Yeah, fuck the grogs. <laughs> um, now, as far as gear, you start out with one spellcasting focus, i.e. your spellbook, one tier one potion of your choice, and one adventuring kit. This is really focusing on the fact that you don't need no fucking weapons, you don't need no fucking armor, you're just going to blast somebody into next fucking Wednesday. Mm-hmm. So, first level, you first level you gain the spell book. You have a spell book which contains all your knows, known spells. As a wizard, you know a number of spells as shown in the wizard spellcasting table. After a rest, you must choose which spells to prepare. You may only cast spells you have prepared from your spell book. Your prepared spells remain prepared until your next rest, at which point you may prepare new spells. Your spell book is an extension of yourself and is magical in nature. If it is lost or stolen, you may summon it to yourself after completing a rest and performing a one-hour ritual. If you are disarmed of your spell book in a threatening encounter, you can summon it back to yourself as a as a ten-foot quick action. 
Your spellbook also counts as a personal effect and thus has no encumbrance attached to it. Remember when I joked about how about how you can get your DM to want you dead by abusing the by abusing the um, summon weapon ability that sword mages have? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you could sell a spellbook though. You pro you probably couldn't, but it'd be fu it'd be funny as hell to use it to use it as collateral for a trade and then summon it back. Would be funny. <laughs> also, be a good way to make your GM really hate you. I don't know. Would it count as lost or stolen? If you're giving it up, if you if you're handing it off uh, of your own will, I don't think it counts. That's probably a DM fiat thing. Yeah. Um. Your spellbook acts as a spell focus, and you must wield it in one hand in order to cast any spell, including spells which utilize weapon foci. <laughs> so you're. That that brings some interesting implications if your if your spellbook also counts as a weapon foci. <laughs> Ooh, you know one of the one one of the feats to uh to to make it like a like the Inquisitor can cast through their weapons, mm -hmm. instead switch it around so that your spellbook is a weapon focus. Mm -hmm. So you are you are smacking people with your book. Hi, scholar. Oh wait, that's a. Uh... Um. Remember, remember the, remember that flat-faced preacher from Berserk. <laughs> yes. <sighs> yes. One that I've Mope. used in plenty of memes with, when I have to deal with when I have to deal with Harry Potter stands who need to read another book. His name is Mosgus. Ah, yeah. The by name, the way, I've I the name slipped by me. You could you could say you could say it went right you could say it went right over his head. Yeah, you could. If, except I think Moscus had the same tall guy problems we do. It'd be hard to get it over his head. However, under his feet, that's mm -hmm. a different one. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um. Anyway, you you may hold your spell book in conjunction with a one-handed spell focus or a two-handed spell focus. Okay. When you hold your spell book with a two-handed spell fo focus, you gain the normal effects of wielding a two-handed spell focus. When you hold your spell book with a one-handed spell focus, you gain plus one to spell attack rolls. Um, <laughs> that brings up some very interesting images. Indeed. <laughs> um. You are able to amplify the spells you cast by spending spell points. You gain a number of spell points as shown in the wizard class table. Da -da -da -da. We've gone over this with previous casters. There is something I need to clarify, actually, because I'm seeing push forward in the normal spell points secondary spell effect stuff. Mm -hmm. If you push forward instead of resting, do you get to prepare new spells? Do you get to prepare spells at all? Yeah, that or is. Or if you choose, is if you be... choose to, yeah. I get the feeling, given given that push forward is assen is essentially a um a, for lack of a better word, a cheat around um resting. I think you should. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not 100 percent certain on how all that's going to work. But we definitely need clarification as to whether it is only a rest at which you get new spells and new and new times to prepare spells, or if it's also at pushing forward. Mm -hmm. um, because if you can't prepare spells when doing a push forward, that's going to make a wizard instantly less desirable than any other caster. Because all other casters get their their uh, spell points and stuff that they recover during a, a push forward, that they only have whatever spells they have. They have you know however many spells they know for their level plus whatever extra spells they get from an archetype. But they have those no matter what. They have those pushing forward and uh, and um, and. Resting don't affect what spells they have in their pocket at that time. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I am assuming that prepared spells are not spent like they were a la spell slots in, you know, actual base D and D. I'm assuming that you prepare your spells at a rest, but much like any of the other casters, you get to cast whatever spells you have prepared and then modify with the secondary spell uh, spell effects using the secondary uh, the spell point system. And that if you do not get to prepare new spells when pushing forward, that just means you're stuck with the spell list you already chose. Yeah, that might that might limp that might um that might create a bit of choice paralysis. So I'm a, and would certainly not fit the kind of game that we've been seeing since we started this series. So I'm yeah. ge I'm guessing that pushing forward you can you can you can respec your um spell list. And your your uh, prepared spell, I should say. And I think that even if it's not being able to choose the entire sp prepare a, a, an entire new list of spells like for example you know prepared spells at 20th is up to five mm -hmm. out of all of the total uh spells you know which is wits mod plus five at 20th level you could have plus five there so you could know 10 different spells out of the 16 in the game mm -hmm. <laughs> and prepare five of them a day so even if at a push forward you're not allowed to change the whole list, being able to change half rounded down, you know, you get the limitations that are put upon by pushing forward because there there are limitations that come with pushing forward rather than just resting. Um, but you still get that customization hot swap that the wizard is looking to play itself around that whole i have access to more spells than anyone which is ironically its weakness in base in this game which only has 16 total spells this makes you a fucking powerhouse i've got access to at, at 20th level i could potentially have access to 10 fucking spells or more maybe Mm -hmm. And I can prepare five of those. And if I can hot swap those whenever I need to, I mean, you could, you could, you could very easily with this right here, build healing and all the elemental damage you'll ever need, and <laughs> into into one character, and it, it it wouldn't be bad at all. So just having a even if you have to limit the hot swap, don't chuck it out entirely for a push forward. That's my recommendation here. I don't know what the original plan is. When Tanner gives us his clarifications, we'll know. Mm -hmm. And maybe he'll have a reason for not giving a push forward that he'll tell us, and or not giving them the ability to sw swap their prepared spells during a push forward that he'll tell us, and we'll go, oh, I can see why you aren't giving it to them. Yeah. We just we just need to... we. For uh, for us, it's a case of, um, for lack of a better term, shit or get off the pot. <laughs> oh, that that and this. I think this is this goes beyond. We need a simple cl clarification. This is a what is the underlying mechanic ideal behind this, mm -hmm. and why do we not see a mention of push forward? That is what we want to know because we have a very distinct picture we've gotten of the game, and we want to see where this fits in that picture. Mm -hmm. So, like, what I do find kind of interesting is that I think this is the only cl I think this is the only class that doesn't that has a, that ha that uses a modifier for the amount of spells known. I think all the other yeah. casting classes had it set. Yes, they had specific amounts at specific levels. Mm -hmm. um, I think the maximum we saw may have been five at twentieth level, which is certainly which. Doesn't sound like much, but from what Tanner has told us, there's not a exhaustive um, list of spells. There's sixteen of them, mm -hmm. sixteen total spells. We've seen, we've talked about them all at this point, ca yeah. going through all the casters. Things like, you know, fire, or wa fire, ice, or water, or, or lightning, earth, mm -hmm. or la light and dark, or wither and madness, and all of those, or rejuvenation. Those are the spell. Hmm. Fire is the spell. And then everything that fire can do 
is defined by how many spell points you dump to get secondary effects added onto it mm -hmm. up to its limit. Yeah. That's been the, the whole casting system this entire time. And I love it because that means it's build a spell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry, I love build a spell. Um, you can... You, you want to know what game you can you can uh, blame for that, Monk? Ars Magica? No. It's a video game, an old video game, in fact. 16-bit uh, era. Treasure of the Rudras, where you yep. could literally build spells by typing in different words. Before you before you had said 16 bit era, I was gonna I was gonna say Eternal Darkness, but <laughs> no. I'm sure that there's at least one person in the uh, audience that was thinking Morrowind, which is a good guess. I like Morrowind and, and how customizable the spells are, but that is not what made me a uh, someone who likes the build the the build a spell workshop mm -hmm. <laughs> um i could now when it comes to spell points the other thing i could the other thing i think is i think is interesting is the fact that they get so few they get they get so few they get they get they get a they get a heck of a lot more secondary effects than some others so there's get there is going to be a whole lot of sp of um build a spell i'd say yep. i'd say they're not they're not the king of secondary effects, though. From what from what we're seeing, that honor still goes to the druid. And, well, and then uh, just like every other caster class we've seen, uh, they get three additional secondary options by the time they hit seventeenth level that don't spend spell points. Mm -hmm. So hitting their secondary effect limit on a on one spell isn't going to spend over the amount of spell points that they have. And now the other thing you get at first level is craft spell scroll. During a period of rest, you can craft a number of spell scrolls up to your maximum. You may only have three spell scrolls at any one time, but may reclaim the power of an existing spell scroll, thereby rendering inert during a period of rest in case a spell scroll is lost or stolen. To create a spell scroll, you choose a spell from among the spells you know. You then choose a primary effect for the spell as if it was being cast from a spell or weapon focus, and a number of secondary effects for the scroll up to the number of secondary effects you could normally channel into a spell. Spell scrolls do not gain any benefits granted to you by your feats, and feats which grant you additional secondary options for spells do not affect your spell scrolls. Doing so does not consume spell points, and any creature may utilize the spell scroll to cast the spell within it. They must be holding the spell scroll to do so. Spell scrolls have the following properties. Spell scrolls written in the spell scrolls effects require an action to utilize, and spell scrolls written with weapon focus effects require a 10-foot quick action to be placed upon a weapon. And I think... Th then, then below that it also says uh, oh, yeah. spell scrolls have an encumbrance of one. Mm-hmm. If an ally uses one of your spell scrolls, they use your attack modifier for the spell attack, mm -hmm. which means they use your wits mod. You do not need to be holding your spell book to cast a spell from a spell scroll. Mm -hmm. Finally, a dev note. Wizards actually have lower spell points when compared to most other casters. The spell scrolls assist in that area, granting them effectively more spell points than other classes, but restraining how those spell points can be used into a one-time use effect. For me, this feeds the class fantasy of wizard in that they are, one, preparing spell scrolls which feel magical and scholarly, and two, supporting a playstyle that is about information gathering and planning, since the wizard is going to benefit a whole, light, a whole lot if they know what sort of encounter they might happen upon ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So if, if we look at this, you, you can have three spell scrolls, and you can craft up to your maximum during a rest period. So I'm guessing spell scroll, I make it makes sense that you have to rest for that because you have to get into your adventuring wagon, get out the things to write it down, etc. Pushing forward doesn't allow for that. That makes sense for that to be fully limited to a period of rest. Um, and so you choose your primary effect, one from the 16 that we know of. Um, whether it's being cast from spell or weapon focus, and then up to the number of secondary effects that you could channel into a spell. 
So at, you could you could for example, I'm going to use fire because we've seen fire as an example time and again. You could make a scroll of fire with nine secondary effects on it at 20th level, and they don't consume spell points when you craft them into a scroll like that. The only time your spell points are consumed is when you're casting on the fly. Holy shit. What the fuck? <laughs> what the new... fuck? Yeah. Three spells of maximum secondary effects that you just make when you rest? And anyone can use them, but it's as if you're casting them because it's using your attack mod. Mm -hmm. Jesus fuck. What the hell, man? See, I have this book full of spells, and I could cast five spells, and I could pump a lot of stuff into these spells, but I also got this scroll of fire that will literally melt a mountain. Here you go. Go use it on that guy. I like this. Mm -hmm. I am a, I've already found... <laughs> I've already fashioned one of our cracked characters, Monk. Okay, what do you got? He is shady. He is tall. He is an elf. But he is, he is the shady back alley spell scroll dealer. He'll sell you a scroll for the right price. Why am I thinking of the merchant from Resident Evil 4? Just What are you buying? There you go. You want you want the merchant? There's the merchant. <laughs> just he just at, just him show him showing up and and going. What do you need that scroll for? Going going hunting for a bullet. <laughs> oh, that that scroll is going to be great for the Tarask. <laughs> <laughs> just, but he's he's seedy. He's covered in like he's covered in cloaks like you would expect of a wizard, but his face is also mostly covered. So you're not quite sure. If you trust this particular wizard. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, so, so I hear, I, I hear you need, uh, I hear you need some lightning magic. What, what do you need it to do? Well, you see, we need it, we need it to be able to hit this many people and with this much, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I can do that. I can do that. Mm -hmm. I, I can do that. Okay. Just, uh, just a couple of, uh, couple of rare materials and you'll get that scroll tomorrow there's a couple of rare materials mm -hmm. maybe 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 a, a tier two potion i just we we, we, we can come up with something hang, just hang just... on let's let's make let's make this even dumber let's combine <laughs> let's combine this idea with the sommelier from john wick 2 <laughs> 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 Yes, this one has a full, robust body. It'll hit 60 feet in a circle. It'll only cost you... Who rare materials? <laughs> no, just des just describing it, just describing each, um, each spell is the same the same way you would describe the the full-bodied <laughs> and a and a robust. Aftertaste. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This, <laughs> this this cracked out character in our cracked out party. Because this the the shady the the shady looking back, back alley elf. Um, that would end that would end up being a little too obvious. But someone who is equally shady, but dre but dressed up but dressed up to the but dressed up to the nines and is. It, and is extremely curt and professional when describing the sheer amount of insane, ridiculous destruction that his spells, that his spell scrolls can make. I find that to be a little bit more cracked and a little bit it more is, our style. It is more our style, and this is the point where you'd have someone like our rogue go, "Dude, even I wouldn't trust you." <laughs> and 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 all the sommelier would have to would have to reply is. You don't have to trust me. Just trust the merchandise. <laughs> <laughs> you, 
He can only make up to three spell scrolls per rest, but if he sells them at high prices, does he really need to go adventuring? Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) And also, at first level, you get Summon Familiar. So, Wizards Familiars take many forms, but unlike the beasts they resemble, they are intrinsically magical. Well, now we're we're getting even more cracked. (laughs) Your Familiar has defense scores equal to your own. Your familiar is held together by your arcane prowess, and as such, does not have hit points. Instead, when your familiar takes damage, you may choose to take that damage in place of your familiar. If you do so, your familiar remains active and is unaffected by the damaging effect. If you do not take the damage in place of your familiar, your familiar disappears, leaving no body, but you may expend a vitality in order to summon it when you push forward, or you may resummon it without expending vitality when you rest. If both you and your familiar take damage from the same source, a dragon's breath attack, for example, you need not expend hit points to maintain your familiar, but still take damage yourself. Um, I think the exp- the expend hit points to to maintain. I think I think that's I think that's supposed to be vitality. No, right, because damage is done in damage is done in hit points mm-hmm. until uh, you get down to your vitality and willpower. Yeah. Um, when your GM calls for an ability check. You, may, you make a single roll for both you and your familiar. Your familiar is an extension of yourself, and while it may grant you certain certain bonus, bonuses to certain abilities, it does not make a separate ability check from you. Your familiar always obeys your commands. In combat, your familiar may move independently of you, but may not take actions or reactions, though it gains the benefits of fighting defensively, recover, or the dash, disengage, or hide actions when you take those. Unless it has a feature which allows it to do so, your familiar cannot speak. You cannot have more than one familiar at a time, though you may change its form after a rest. So what you're telling me is I, we literally can make our sommelier, and its familiar is John Wick. Um, so when, well, all familiars have the following features. Focal point. While your familiar is within 30 feet of you, you may use your familiar as the focal point for any spell you cast effectively extending your range with those spells. I'm getting Shaman flashbacks. Limited telepathy. While your familiar is in 100 feet of you, you may communicate with it tele- telepathically. Shared senses. As an action, you may enter a trance-like state and see through your familiar's eyes and hear what it hears until the start of your next turn. You may choose to stay in this trance-like state each turn without losing your action. During this time, you are deaf and blind with regard to your own senses. While you are controlling your familiar, you still use your own skills and proficiencies for any ability checks made through the familiar. Aetheric Shift. As an action, you may temporarily dismiss your familiar. It disappears into a pocket dimension where it awaits your summons. Alternatively, you can dismiss it forever. As an action, while it is temporarily dismissed, you may cause it to reappear in any unoccupied space within 30 feet of you. All familiars have a size category, tiny, have a carrying capacity of 1, and cannot otherwise interact with objects unless their encumbrance is equal to or below one. So it's a John Wick the size of a mouse. <laughs> Let's see. It says, First, you must choose the type of creature you wish to summon. Oftentimes, this will help you distinguish your familiar's form. The following options should provide you with examples, though the, fo- though the, though the form of your familiar is up to you. So we have the choice between beast, aberration, construct, and undead. Um, I would consider John Wick an aberration. <laughs> they call him Baba Yaga. What are you talking about? Mm-hmm. But if we if we have to give our if we have to give our shifty sommelier wizard a a um a familiar, um, I would I would on um, I would. Uh, there's a few. There's a few that I can think of, but because of how fancy it is, I could I could see him having a bir- having a um, bird as a familiar that's that's constantly keeping watch outside his shop. I was going to say a raven. Uh, ra- raven's a raven's a little too cliche. Let's go with a falcon instead. Uh, what about a swallow? That'll work. Damn it, monk! What? You didn't ask the question. The question? 
I'm not vaccine. African or European. <laughs> I'm not. Do I'm not falling for that. See, the funny thing is, I I do know the difference between African and European. <laughs> Tim the Enchanter would not would not be able to do anything to me. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, the the bridge guardian. Excuse me. Yeah. See. So, anyway, next, choose the type of movement that best that best suits your familiar. Either movement speed five feet and thirty feet of of fly speed. Um, move twenty feet and climb speed of climb speed of twenty feet, and if you choose this, you can cl you're familiar you can climb difficult surfaces, including upside down on ceilings, um, without needing to make an ability yeah, check. Yep. Or tw or twenty twenty feet and swim feet swim speed of twenty feet. When you choose this one, your own swim speed increases by five feet, and your familiar is able to breathe underwater. Or twenty feet and you. And you gain one tier of expertise in the Arcana skill. So you either get a flying, a climbing, or a swimming uh, familiar that have additional stuff to them and give you a little bit of an, of stuff. Mm -hmm. Or you have just a normal old land critter and uh, you get an ex expertise in, in Arcana because of it. Mm -hmm. That's nice. See, so next you must choose what special senses your familiar possesses. For the purposes of navigation and utilization, you gain the benefits of these features whenever your familiar is near you. You either get blind sight ten, for 10 feet, um, dark vision, keen senses, or keen sight. So you can you can you can either um, either see either see ten either see ten feet when you're completely blind. Um, um, ignore, ignore, ignore for severity of um, hit of hidden. If if through it... non-magical darkness, mm -hmm. um, advantage on hearing or smell, or proficiency in investigation. And la lastly, you choose which special ability your familiar possesses. Either mimicry, so it can your familiar can speak in your own voice through your familiar when you're in trance. Strong bond. If you were to take damage, you may reduce that damage equal to your class ability modifier. Um, I think that's supposed to be wits in this case. Yeah. Um, hard to hit. Attacks of opportunity made against your familiar are made with disadvantage. Or quick. The movement types associated with your familiar increase by 10 feet. So if we're going to give him a bird, it's uh, fly speed of 30. Um... Keen sight or keen senses? Keen sight? Yeah, keen Bird? sight. Makes sense because most birds do their tracking by sight. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then of course I think uh, hard to hit would probably be the third one. Pro probably, although although it would be it would be amusingly creepy to use mimicry. <laughs> Go into a trance, have a have a have a sparrow. Or sw uh, swallow, uh, say, say, talk in your voice. Mm -hmm. People would be like, "What the fuck is that?" And they'd just be like, "Oh, that's just his bird." Mm -hmm. Especially since the the way I see it, when it comes to the guy's shop, it's a bit of a walk to where the shop actually is. So and so, but he has the he has the swallow um, sta standing out standing outside to let people know if they can come in or not. Or when somebody's scroll is ready, he su he sends the swallow off to tell them, mm -hmm. "Please come retrieve the spell scroll you ordered." Mm -hmm. So at second level, you gain applied research. After a period of rest, you may replace any of your spell feats with a different spell feat for which you meet the prerequisite. <clears throat> Dev note: This is another huge feature. F this is the other huge feature for the wizard. Like the spell scroll mechanic, this feature rewards wizards for studying threats and encounters before jumping into them. It fits the wits play style perfectly in that the wizard can effectively change how they interact with the game during a rest, making them super fluid, as long as they've done the necessary research, of course. It also differentiates them from the sorcerer, who affects magic on the fly without making them better than the sorcerer as seen as is seen in too many games. Oh. And it is it is something that I wish more games with feat systems would do more often. You would think, you would think that with the fighter being able to do that, the fighter being able to do all do all the weapons or the wizard doing all the spells, 
that even it, when they introduced meta magic in 3.5, that they'd be able to switch that kind of stuff around. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you can switch around your you can switch around your prepared spells, but what if your prepared spells don't match up with your meta magic? Very true. Tis an issue for the ages mm -hmm. and has been solved here. Effectively, what effectively what we're seeing the wizard doing in the in this kind of setup is turn is turning the caster into the equivalent of the old pick ten. <laughs> As somebody who probably spent way too much time um, set, setting up weapons, attachments, and perks, you know, before they got out of hand, but I digress. Yep. Um, also, also cursing whoever picked Last Stand or Juggernaut. <sighs> anyway, at second level, you also gain a bonus spell feat. You gain a spell. You gain a spell casting feat. As a bonus feat, you gain an additional one at 5th, 7th, 11th, and 17th level. At 3rd level, you gain a wizard archetype. Basically, our subclasses, which we will get to that in a, we will get to that later. And you gain features for that at 6th, 10th, 14th, and 18th level. And at 20th level, for your capstone, you gain Archmage. Your wits increases by 4... And you gain two additional spell casting feats. Yay! Dev note, while you, which you can switch after a period of rest like all the others, making this less of a simple increase and more of a that's a lot of, of, of more flexibility I just got increased. So let hang on, let me scroll let me scroll up. So So by twentieth level you'll have you'll have <clears throat> one, two, three, four Five, six, seven spellcasting feats that you can flip flop and swap on all you want. Mm -hmm. And At I twentieth level, you probably meet the prerequisites for just about any of them. I get the feeling that um, feat prerequisites, and ob obviously we don't know this for certain since we haven't we haven't delved head on into feats yet. But I get the feeling that a lot that um, prerequisites for feats are go are going to be fairly open. Yeah. Especially especially for if you want the the, the flip floppy feet uh, finagling that we see going here um, they're going to need to be set, somewhat open just to allow a wizard to go well I have these seven feats but now I want to switch it up. Let's switch it out for these seven feats. Or maybe I like these two feats here they've been really useful so far. Let's switch out these five. Mm-hmm. That's just a. Uh, that's just so much fun. Mm -hmm. Let's see. At third, at third level, you. All right. Sorry, I already mentioned that. So then we get to the archetypes, and the first is Arcanist. When most imagine a wizard, they imagine they imagine the Arcanist, adept at casting spells more so than any other archetype. At third level, they gain studious preparation. You may prepare an additional spell per day. Your, and well, your, there you go. <laughs> And your spell point maximum increases by one, and may recover one additional spell point whenever you push forward. Even better! Mm -hmm. At sixth level, you gain spell Echo. If you cast a spell on your last turn, you may cast a spell, choosing one less secondary option than the spell you cast on your previous turn, without the expenditure of spell points. <laughs> what the fuck?! This means that you could you could cast you could you could you could dump you could dump all the damn secondary options you can on that first spell and keep casting slightly weaker versions of it for turn after turn without spending anything. What the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck? <sighs> Now, granted, it still has to be one of the spells you prepared, so it's not as crazy as it could be. But um, keep in mind that keep in mind that twentieth level, you're gonna have nine secondary options. So you could just so you could just dump all you could just dump all of that in what in one round and just keep going. And three of those are free. Mm -hmm. So yeah, spell echo is is gonna be fun. Um, it, it, at, it, it's 
It's fucking storm casting from old magic, dude. Yeah. So, 10th level, you gain overcharge. A calculated risk. One that will hopefully pay off in the future. Now, missed opportunity. You should have gone a calculated risk. Unfortunately, I'm bad at math. It, no, no, he can't say that because this is the wizard. Yeah. And it's very studious, very knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. The a wizard will not be bad at math. <laughs> the maximum amount of secondary options you may channel into a spell increases by one. You must still expend spell points for this additional option. You may channel up to two secondary options into a spell you cast without expending spell points. If you do, you gain a curse which triggers and is afterwards purged on your next spell attack, imposing disadvantage on it. You may not utilize this feature to grant yourself secondary options if you are cursed by this feature. Dev note. I'll word this better later. Basically, you're o you're overcasting to get you're overcasting at a cost. So, you channel two secondary options without spell points that are separate from the free ones you already get. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you do, you're cursed with disadvantage on your next spell attack. But once the curse is triggered on your next spell attack, uh, you may not utilize the feature. Or once once it, once you've cast the spell that's got the curse and disadvantage, the curse is purged. Mm -hmm. But you can't use the utilize the feature again for the free secondary options if you're already cursed. So what this sounds like is this spell. If I'm if I'm if if I'm if I'm understanding this correctly, and that's why he put the dev note of wording it better later, you take spell one. Okay, this is going to be a chain of spells that I'm descri describing. Spell one, you channel the two free secondary options and gain the curse. Mm -hmm. And then that spell goes off. Spell two is now the spell that is cursed. So you have disadvantage on it. But it has to be a spell attack. So would that mean rejuvenation wouldn't trigger this curse? Clarification. That's a yeah. good clarification to add. But again, he already has a dev note here that he's going to word it better later. Yeah. So there's probably these clarifications that I'm making in my head are for our benefit and the benefit of the audience. He's likely already got an idea of how he's going to clarify this. It'd make an interesting combination alongside spell echo. Essentially cursing <laughs> every, other, every other spell. Could you do that? Oh, man! I don't think you could do that. You could do it on the first one, and then the second one would have disadvantage, but you'd still have two extra secondary options that you wouldn't have had normal. So you have the overcharged spell, and then a slightly less overcharged spell that's also cursed, and then the normal max power spell you would have cost as your third spell in the echo chain. Mm -hmm. But decide that. The second spell is what's cursed. When you cast it, the curse is then purged, whether you hit with that spell or not. You just have disadvantage on the roll. Mm -hmm. But if you if you overcharge spell one, and then you don't cast a spell next turn, you do something else. You still got the curse. You're holding on to that curse, and you can't later with spell two try to add the second the two secondary free secondary options because you have that curse. You can't be cursed again. You have to purge the curse first before you can get the curse back. Yep. That's how I understand it from a mechanical level. Yeah, the the fact of the matter is, um, the uh, <laughs> some somebody who somebody who's doing who's doing this particular thing and the, and is just is um, I would I I end up being reminded in a weird way of of Lulu's fury overdrive in Final Fantasy X. <laughs> just cast and keep, just cast and keep casting. Never stop casting. Mm -hmm. Oh. At 14th level, you gain Scholarly Caster. Your wit score increases by 2, and your spell point maximum increases by 1, and may, you may recover 1 additional spell point whenever you push forward. Or, I, I think a or rest should also be added. Unless it uh, unle unless it's push forward only, which I doubt. Well, no, because remember that you, when you rest, you get all of your spell points back. Fair point. So it's only during push forwards. Mm -hmm. And at 18th level, you gain spell Slinger. 
You gain a spell feat of your choice, as if you didn't have enough already. So now you've got eight if you're an Arcanist at level 20. Mm -hmm. Your spell point maximum increases by two, and you may recover two additional spell points whenever you push forward. So hold on, hold on. Just by being an Arcanist, you get four additional spell points added to your maximum. So now you're at 12 spell points, which matches, I believe, the the Sorcerer. And you can recover... No, the Sorcerer was like 16 or something like that. 18. But like it gets up there. It's up there. You, you, get four, you get 12 as your maximum, and you can recover 10 on a push forward now. You get an extra spell... So if you do have the maximum wits mod like we're thinking, instead of 10 and 10 prepared spells, you get 11 and 6 prepared spells. Mm -hmm. I think. Or did I read that wrong? No, you only prepare an additional spell per day. So you get 10, but now you can prepare 6. Um, and then, of course, now you have one additional spell feat. So that one additional spell feat, now you've got 8 of them at level 20 that you get to play flip-floppy uh, flip floppy feet finagling. Mm -hmm. I, <clears throat> flip floppy feet finagling tm there we go mm -hmm. i'm trademarking that you can <laughs> have it though tanner you can have it put that on a t-shirt tanner yeah flip flop flip floppy feet finagling mm -hmm. oh so arcanist just gets to play around with doing all of the spell things yeah i know we i know we remarked we remarked that um that I think the sorcerer is the is the most ca is what is the more casty, but I think in I think in the arcanist case it's more it's more of being almost like a turret with the amount of spells that with the amount of spell use that they can do because you can buy you combine that those ridiculous maximums with the with the over, with the overcharge and spell echo combo we talked about earlier. Yep. Yep. This is all about uh, using your spells and not your scrolls as well. So mm -hmm. this is this is magic in the moment. This is you just being like, okay, so here is my overcharged fire with not nine, uh, nine secondary options on it, but eleven. Eleven of them. Mm -hmm. I'll be cursed next turn, sure. But here, have a miniature sun. Next turn, I roll with disadvantage. Oh, I still hit. Here, I have a slightly smaller miniature sun. Well, now I'm out of the extra options I had. Here, here, have an even slightly smaller miniature sun. This is just going to keep going for another eight turns, guys. Mm -hmm. do, do, is, is the encounter over yet? Nope. Okay, here's another miniature sun. And okay, fine. Here's a giant meteorite instead, rather than a miniature sun. And let's not, for <laughs> let's not forget... Um, Echo doesn't specify that you have to cast the exact same spell each round. Yes, yeah, could be different spells. You could start with a miniature sun and then go to a slightly smaller. Um... Ooh, what's a good one? I know, a nebula because you see space lightning in nebulas here. <laughs> I'm just I'm just gonna cycle through the elements over and over again. Here you go. I, I only have you know six spells on, but they're all elemental, fucker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um. Now next is chronicler. People underestimate the life of a chronicler. Recording the events of the world requires you to survive the events of the world. You'll never find a more durable and steadfast magic user in your travels than the chronicler. At third level, he gains travel research. You gain proficiency in history and nature. You increase the lowest of your physical ability scores by two. If two ability scores are tied for your lowest, you choose which one you increase. At sixth level, you gain worldly experience. You gain two tiers of expertise and a skill of your choice with which you have proficiency. And you increase a physical ability score of your choice by two. At tenth level, you gain multifaceted. You gain a general feat of your choice, and you choose to either increase your carrying capacity by two, or increase your, or increase your climb and swim speed by five feet. You may and change you your choice. Between... You can change between the two at a rest. Mm -hmm. I'm going to carry more today. Okay. Oh. Uh, <laughs> at fourteenth level, you gain augmentation of the mind and body. 
After a period of rest, you may replace any of your general feats with a different general feat with which you meet oh, your requisites. And you, my get God. Gen- and you get a general feat of your choice. What the fuck? <laughs> the class is not the only thing that grants feats, Monk. You can get general feats from other sources. Mm-hmm. Any of your general feats. Yep. Not just the two general feats you've gotten from this this archetype, but any of your other general feats, too. Mm-hmm. No, now you want to switch around spell feats and general feats and rest? You can! <laughs> what at the fuck? Eight, at 18th level, you gain augmented experience. You gain another general feat of your choice. Jesus you increase Christ. your lowest two physical ability scores by two. If they're equal, you choose which two. And you increase your highest physical ability score by two. If two are equal, you choose which one to increase. So this is effectively, you increase all three of your physical ability scores by two. Mm -hmm. Or, if you've got tied scores, you can potentially raise one of them twice. I had initially thought that the Chronicler would be the Lore Master wizard. That is not the case. The Chronicler is 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 the traveling caster one. Unk. Do you know why you build a chronicler? Why? So that you can pick up another motherfucker with your mind and beat another motherfucker with him. <laughs> this is I cast fist in reverse. Yeah. You're just making yourself real physically tanky so that when you take hits, you're like you fucked with the wrong magic caster. And then you just fire right in the face. Just mm-hmm. burn their face right off. They hit you with a sword. Whoosh! There goes your face. I'm sorry, you had a head. Now it's ashes. Yep. Let's see, next we have Hierophant. It's nice to see a essentially a div- essentially a divine wizard because in a lot of in a lot of other games, the equivalent of a Hierophant would just be would would just get the response of just make a cleric. Except a cler a cleric has casty and fighty, and that and that doesn't really fit the hierophant um, concept. So, at third level, you gain sacred words, not to be confused by the by the blind guardian song. Also very good. Whenever you or an ally cast a spell using a spell scroll you have made, the user gains temporary hit points equal to half your level rounded up plus your wits modifier, plus your proficiency modifier. Spell scroll! Now makes a temporary HP shield, too! At 6th level, you gain Grace of the Faithful. When you finish your rest, roll two d20s and record the numbers rolled. You can replace any attack roll or any ability check made by you or a creature you can see with one of those rolls. You must choose to do so before the roll, and you can replace a roll in this way only once per turn. If you replace an attack roll with this feature, that attack cannot critically hit. Each roll can be used only once. When you finish a rest, you lose any unused rolls. Dev note. I thought this was a good feature, so now it's here. I would like to note that most of the features you've had where you record some sort of roll prior Mm -hmm. or have the ability to change roll results have always been after the roll, but before the D the, before the GM announces results. Mm Mm-hmm. I would recommend that this also be the case for Grace of the Faithful. Yeah. So that you have the consistency. Mm -hmm. Plus, you could roll roll two d20s and get some god-awful numbers. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So at... uh, Yeah, imagine if you you roll a two two and a three. Well, that's that's two attacks that you can now screw over. Yep. Because remember, rolling that low but not critting, that's, one, that's still an automatic fail, and two, um, could, here's a, here's a bit of a question, could this feature be used to make, to make someone automatically botch? Yes. You can replace any attack roll or ability check made by you or a creature that you can see with one of these rolls. That's going to be interesting. Yeah, imagine someone trying to take a swing at the hierophant, and then all of a sudden, the the um their their high roll is replaced is replaced with a natural one. Yeah, but it I don't think it can it, it can critically fail. I just think it auto fails. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, at 10th level, you gain improved transcription. The number of created spell scrolls you may have at one time increases by one. You can have four of them. <laughs> I mean, it's four encumbrance, because they all have encumbrance one, but mm -hmm. still. Mm -hmm. oh. At 14th level, you gain Glory of the Righteous. Your Sacred Words feature now applies to all allies within 30 feet of the scroll, rather than just the scroll user themselves. In addition, the scroll user becomes Lucid 2. Hold on, I'm pulling that up now. I don't think Lucid is the term used for that status anymore. Um, Tanner, I don't know if this was old old phraseology, kind of like how there was uh, old old phrasing for what eventually became the compelled status. Um, I am not finding lucid in the in the actual status effects, so need some a uh, need some clarification there. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that that's definitely one that that's definitely one that we need that we need to figure out um, what that does. I demand. I have I have some guesses, but yeah, I think I think the term should be updated. If it is updated when we come back next week, I'll um, I'll co we'll cover it. Okay. You know, like we did that catch up when it came to the duelist. Yeah. Oh, uh, at eighteenth level, you gain trappings of a saint. You may create one spell scroll whenever you push forward. You may apply. So I was right. <laughs> you may apply the benefits. Granted to you by your spell feats to spell scrolls you create. <laughs> what? <laughs> Party of wizards. <laughs> the sommelier and his buddies. <laughs> the sommelier is definitely the occultist. I'm, all, I'm calling it now. Oh, speaking of which, let's get to the occultist. So, at third level, the occultist gets study in the occult. You gain proficiency in four ritual artistries of your choice. At sixth level, you gain Ishu components. You may perform common rituals without paying their material cost. You increase the lowest of your mental ability scores by two. If two or more are tied for the lowest, you pick one. At 10th level, you gain Efficient Rituals. You may reduce the material cost of uncommon, rare, and very rare materials you perform by one tier. At 14th level, you gain Stored Ritual. You may store the effects of a common, uncommon, or rare ritual to be used at a later point. To do so, you must spend the normal time and material to prepare the ritual. This Its cost cannot be reduced by your class features. Good call there. The ritual is then stored in a scroll, though it does not count against your maximum number of scrolls, and can be actualized by using your action. Only one ritual may be stored in this way. And then... And at 18th level, you may store the effects of, 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 a ver of very rare and legendary rituals as you could common, uncommon, and rare rituals. In addition, you may store an additional ritual this way for a total of two stored rituals. I'm telling you, the sommelier is the occultist. <laughs> if he's selling spell scrolls, people are also going to ask for rituals. Which would also explain what also explain why he spent. He probably spends a lot of time in in tra in trance um, when it comes when it comes to going when it comes to going around a given city. Because I get, I get the feeling that he that he is he is the type who um, would mostly communicate through his familiar until it's time to actually do business. Yeah. Which 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 um, makes it which makes it very very difficult to figure out where his shop is because the the only people who see the only people who see him um, have ar have already got have already gotten the business and. Obviously, that obviously they don't want to divulge that particular secret, and by this point, he probably has a shadow broker level of um, 
level of level of mutually assured because if anybody blabs about it, everybody else who's been utilizing his services is going to get pissed. Not only that, um, it's very likely that they probably have ritual spells he's given them before. And uh, all he has to do is send his birdie to touch one to activate it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to activate the ritual that you wanted to use on your enemy on you because you talked about me. But this is this is the this is the sommelier and his buddies. <laughs> um, the sommelier and obviously a very high level uh, official in the church who actually works with the underground. Um. The guy he sends out to get materials, his chronicler. Yeah. And the other guy he sends out as his hitman, the Arcanist. So I was wrong. The familiar is not John Wick. The Arcanist is. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's no. fucking John Wick in magic. No, you're not you're not wrong. And um the fact that the fact that I have in some in some of in one particular design that that I have used free I've used frequently that showed up in D twenty modern is the crystal pistol. Um, <laughs> I modified I modified that to be to be okay. You're okay. You have wizards who have wands, but the wand has the shape of a gun. It's not an actual gun, but it's a wand. It's essentially a wand that's firing spells when you pull when you pull the trigger. Closest thing to a caster you could make. Mm -hmm. The mostly because the. Ca the outlaw style style caster, all that would really be, all that caster shells would be would, would just be um, spell scrolls. Yeah. Yeah. One hundred percent. Yes. So you'll we... see no argument from me here. So, so Tanner, Tanner, buddy, you officially have fourteen classes that I want to play every fucking one of them, <laughs> and I don't know which one I want to start with. <laughs> Odds are I'm you're torn be between. You're t one of them is probably the Inquisitor. I'm torn right now. I'm torn between Wizard, Inquisitor, and uh, there's a third that I really wanted to play. Forget which one it is right now. I have to go look again. Inquisitor and Wizard are the two that stick most, though. Mm -hmm. Which is saying something because you don't strike me as somebody who plays casters all that much in in games that you're in. I tend to play whatever is needed because I'm that guy at the table who always knows how to fit in and make sure that the goddamn hodgepodge mishmash party of stupid at least has one competent person, which usually means I end up playing a skill monkey or a gish. I'd say, I'd say that kind of thing is a consequence of G, of DMs not um not doing what I do and set and setting up a primer about about what about um what sort of what sort of characters are going to be good or bad ideas. I know a lot of people like to do the whole oh you can you can do any except when you do that you end up with weird ass parties that have no real cohesion. You know you know what game doesn't actually have this issue which I find hilarious that it doesn't have this issue monk. What? Tenra. Oddly enough, yeah, oddly enough, I I can certainly see that, but I'm curious as to as to as to why you say that. Most of the classes all have something that make them. Um, I mean, they're all unique in the way that they that each of them perform. Mm -hmm. But most of the classes don't have anything that prevent them from from. Uh, interacting with the game world vibrantly um well much also, like how let's also not forget the fact that it's tenra doesn't technically have classes yes i know they're technically actual character build types mm -hmm. um more o almost akin to races than classes um yeah they're archetype packages is yeah is, is the setup yeah but none of the archetypes is there to fill in a hole that another archetype misses. And none of the archetypes really have holes that need filled. They all interact with the game world in a, in a unique fashion, but this does not actually limit them. Like, say, not having a cleric in a normal party of D&D &D 
limits the rest of the party. Mm -hmm. um, yes, you can get characters that have healing things, like the bug people. <laughs> you want to you want a healer? Get a bug person. Bug people are really good at being healers. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you don't necessarily need a healer. But not having one is not going to hamstring you in the long run. Um, and I think that's one of the things I really like about Tenra, other than the fact that it encourages um, players complementing each other in the form of the, the whole uh, Ki tokens. The Ki tokens, I'd say, is one, and the emotion matrix. Exactly. Uh, um, I'd say one... I'd say one... Uh, that whole that whole cohesion issue, I'd I I look at that as a consequence of the fact that so, and I'm going to be covering this in detail when the Coriolis review comes up, mm -hmm. but a lot of games don't put don't put in mechanics for group play, i.e. i.e. a i.e. a shared background with all, with all the um, all with the player characters. Yeah. Um, an example of this that that I'll bring up is. Is the is the group is the um, party sheet in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Third Edition, which I know mm -hmm. is one of those verboten ones, but I don't give a shit. Um, and there's two. There's it ha These are things like brave young fools, or I or idealists, or some something that basically answers the question of what of how to, of what kind of what what group of people are we dealing with, even with all the different backgrounds. What's the party's theme mm -hmm. and this will usually this will usually have a couple things one obvious obviously there's the fortune pool that that is that is utilized once there but they have but each party each party sheet has its has a unique ability to it and has and has um and has one or t has one two or three talent slots where you can yeah or, any um any party member can slot in the appropriate talent, whether it be a tactic, or a, or a reputation, or something or something like that, and everybody gets that particular talent. Yeah, and uh and with heavens and heresies, the the group dynamic that we've been seeing is not only emphasized by the mechanics for the classes that everything synergizes and. Every class changes the game in a big way. Mm -hmm. In a, fundamental changes was the, was what Tanner used. Yeah. Fundamentally changes the the, the way the game is played. Mm -hmm. But it also it, 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 it's also aimed towards group play because no one class can be a big damn hero. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only time you're allowed to be the big damn hero is when you're dying. You raise that death flag, you get all of those bonuses to make sure that everyone else gets out. That's usually what that would mean. Most death flags are used for that in anime and other uh, other um, art forms, video games too. And fuck you, grogs, I can already hear you reading. Many, many video games shouldn't be tabletop. Eat shit and die. Mm -hmm. We've said this time and again on the Monastery you're stuck in the fucking past and your nostalgia and your fucking elitist puritanism. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, uh, but you know, this, this game from what I've seen, it is, it, it is meant to, everybody has fun working together as a team to achieve whatever goals you might be achieving at that time. And it's also, it also, uh, can inspire those, big moments in play if you if you maybe the roles are bad maybe maybe it just you know that was the luck of the fucking dice that day rng jesus decided to take out his red hot pokers and shove them up their ass so someone gets to go huh is my class a perfect part for this would having the unlimited power of my class unleashed and unbridled help everybody else get to safety should I do that? And then they raise the death flag because, you know, they're out of they're out of HP, they're out of vitality, they're out of willpower. So they just raise that death flag and they go for it. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that there is that mechanic for the clinch comeback sacrifice because those are big moments of me big memorable moments in play for any table. 
whether intentional or not. The fact that this is something baked in to have that option of the big damn hero moment for a character that you're like, I think I've done everything that I want to with this character. I want to try a new character. And we're in a situation that's really fucking shitty. So you just go signal that you're using your death flag and you everybody else gets out. You, you roll up and write up a new character, mm. new class, new backgrounds, new everything. But hey, you had fun with the the other one, and they got a big damn hero moment. I just I love that idea. I really do. Um, again, part of the reason I want to play every class at least once, and I'm just like, which one first? <laughs> However, there is one there is one other angle we do. I think we should um co I think we should cover since we've we've kind of di we've kind of dipped into it with the last few weeks. And that okay. is go and that is going back to the ble to the paladin and paragon effects and what and what they give the wizard. <laughs> okay, I'll open that up now. <laughs> so I, I got uh, it in, I got it in front of me. So for wizard, your ally gains a number of spell points either at the beginning or at the end of the encounter, your choice, depending on your level. So for it's one spell point for essentially for every tier. So first through fourth, one, and then ev and then one more for five through ten, one more for eleven through sixteen, and one more for seventeen through twenty. And then the the paragon, uh, your attacks apply an additional severity of banish. <laughs> and if everybody remembers. Probably not. You can go watch the Paladin episode for more on that. But mm -hmm. banish is the is the <laughs> is the uh, condition where if they if the banish severity uh, surpasses the creature's proficiency bonus and their main ability modifier, they're banished to their native plane of existence. And if they're native to the plane of existence you're on, they go to a demi-plane for one minute or until you're no longer threatened, whichever is longer. And then it reappears. Um, I wonder how 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 de how devastating would a would a paragon hierophant combo be? Paragon, Hierophant, and Vessel, and Herald all of the same path? <laughs> yeah. That sounds... I don't want to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just got... I think I just answered my own question. I... But... I can play a would Hierophant. It, <laughs> would it be, I don't think it would... I don't think it would be off base to say that a Hierophant is a white mage. Like I know some people say that white that clerics are are white mages, but no, um. no, no monk actually no. You know you know what 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 hierophants are. What? They have a familiar. They cast from a spell book. They put on temporary shields. They're in the most scholarly class of the game. They're scholars. They're outright scholars. Yeah, except for one problem. They're not AFK all the time. Oh, so they're Endwalker scholars. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, as I, as I said beforehand... Next week is not going to be as brief as this one. Well, brief by our standards. Yeah, under under two hours is pretty brief. And that's because that's because we're going to be tackling equipment next week. Equipment and a lot of and a lot of the item systems, which we have dipped into, especially when we talked briefly about resonance, because it was important to the ranger when we covered that class. Yep. But. This is where this is where we're going to be get we're going to be diving in we're going to be diving into that kind of thing head first because the ne because we are now done with the ancestries and classes chapter now we're going into artistries spells and equipment which also means that not only are we going to be dealing with items item use possibly item creation 
we're also going to be delving into the weapon system that we kind of dipped into. Kind of, sort of, but not really. Mm -hmm. And the, it's very clear that the that the equipment system is not going to be the same as it as it is in vanilla. And there's, I'm probably going to have several bullet points when I send my when I send my message. But we have, we are going some of the things we're going to be dealing with is personal effects, raw materials and loot, material composition, adventuring kits, arms and armor, arms and armor kits, potions and magic items, and. Tanner has been rubbing his palms for weeks, waiting for, waiting for us to tackle magic items. I know. He's also been rubbing his palms for weeks, waiting for us to tackle feats. Which, that will, be, that will probably be covered before the year is out. And it's certainly going to be interesting when we do. Feats. Especially once we uh, consider coming... <laughs> we'll go to feats and we'll fondly remember, Oh yeah! The wizard can switch around his uh, his spell feats, and the chronicler can switch around general feats too. Mm -hmm. Huh? And then we go and look at the feats, and we go, "What the fuck?" Again. <laughs> Just what the fuck? Mm -hmm. But that that will but that of course will do it for this particular episode of Valley of the Judge. We'll be back here next week with more bit with more bits of insanity. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>